Let's proceed. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court, Zachary Hillman on behalf of the Commonwealth. With me this morning is Assistant District Attorney Christopher Henry, who argued the motion down below. The, this case begins and ends with the presumption that the defendant received a plea colloquy, that the plea colloquy was legally sufficient, and that the defendant's plea was voluntary <coughs> and intelligent. That presumption remains in place unless and until it is rebutted by specific, credible, and reliable evidence. The presumption is the default. It is not, as the defendant urged the judge, a piece of evidence with piece of evidence which he can disregard or discredit. That, however, is what the judge did in this case. He acknowledged the principle of a presumption of regularity, and then he said several times that he was not going to presume that his colloquy 15 years earlier had been sufficient. Well, wasn't he also saying, uh, I've, I've been reversed sometimes by the appeals court and the SJC on my colloquies, and so I can't assume that I did the right thing. Not essentially, Your Honor. He made a finding, which was that he had been reversed um, at some point in the mid-90s on a jury waiver colloquy. He doesn't go on to say why he was reversed. He doesn't say what the case name was. He doesn't explain how his jury waiver colloquy or what part of his jury waiver colloquy may have been found insufficient. It's only jury, but it's, it's focused on jury waiver, not the whole colloquy. Exactly, Your Honor. He then also says that he's relying on other cases. We don't know what those cases are. We don't know if those are cases in which he was involved. General case law out of this court or the appeals court, what those cases say. In short, his findings here were wholly insufficient to support the conclusion that his presumption wouldn't apply here. Theoretically, you, you would agree, right, that if that, that the problem is the find, what you say is the problem is the findings don't support getting rid of the presumption. But in theory, a judge could conclude that, yes, I know that presumption is there, but it's rebuttable, and here are the reasons why I feel it is rebutted, and therefore I'm granting a new Absolutely, trial. Absolutely, Your Honor. I, I want to make very clear that I'm not suggesting um, that a judge cannot rely on his or her customary practice in order to reconstruct the record. Um, that happens all the time and is often the best evidence um, as to what happened um, when a period of time has passed record has been destroyed and um, the defendant moves to vacate his plea. What we have here is simply um, a record that doesn't set out adequate reasons in order to rebut the presumption. And I also want to make clear that he doesn't, the judge in this case didn't apply the presumption correctly. His findings suggest that he had to find by a preponderance of the evidence, inferably after the Commonwealth has shown him that the presumption should apply. And that's not the way the presumption works. The presumption is, as I said, the default in this case. That's what this court said in Commonwealth versus Lopez. So the findings that the judge made here, um, as I talked about the, the uh, cases in which he had been reversed on his jury waiver colloquy, these other cases, he also cites the fact that there is no docket entry in this case. That was a clearly erroneous factual finding. In both cases, there is an entry, a stamp on the docket that says the defendant waived his right to a jury trial and pleaded guilty voluntarily, knowingly, and intelligently. That's a finding that could only have been made after the judge conducted a colloquy. There's also a sheet in the clerk's file in both cases in which the judge checked a box indicating that he would only accept the defendant's plea after he had conducted a colloquy. So, the finding that he, re that he makes that there's no docket entry was clearly erroneous. I, I'm, I'm a bit confused by your argument. I, as far as I can tell, you accept the proposition that where a judge says, I did many <coughs> colloquies back in the day, and I recognize looking back that the colloquies that I gave were insufficient then, that that would be sufficient for a judge to say, I know that I did them wrong, and therefore, I will not accept the presumption with regard to me because I know I did them wrong. That would be sufficient. Yes. Okay, and, uh, and here you have a judge who appears to be saying that, but did, but did not articulate with any particular precision what he was really saying or what his reasons were for believing that. Uh, yes, yes. And, I, and so why not just remand it back to the judge and say, we, we accept the view that you could do this, but we're not at all, we're not sure what basis you have for making those findings, and we want you to delineate 
your reasons for saying that your earlier plea colloquies were inadequate, and we'll evaluate that record when it comes back to us. Well, I think for, <clears throat> for this reason, Your Honor, the judge made his findings in this case, and he just applied the findings, which were inadequate, um, to he applied the findings and he misapplied the law. And I think that's why. We can't expect that he's gonna be able to make any more sufficient findings because he says, I don't remember, and he's not able to set out with any specificity what was incorrect with his guilty plea colloquies way back in 1995 or 1996. And the fact that he applies those very uh, vague and ambiguous set of findings incorrectly to um, the law, or he applies the law incorrectly with respect to those findings. I think there's nothing more that can be had here. He, he simply put, he, he misapplied the law when he determined that he wasn't going to presume because he didn't have a memory of what his guilty plea colloquy practice was in the mid-90s. But he, well, but if he, I mean, usually when, when somebody misapplies the law, we send it back to apply the law correctly, right? I mean, in, in many cases. In, in, yes, yes, you're right. I mean, when, when it's this kind of thing. And I, I mean, I, I appreciate about that he didn't remember, but then he does go on and talk about, obviously, a memory. I mean, I don't know whether the memory is accurate or not, but he does talk about a memory. So it's a, it's a kind of mixed situation. Yes, and I, I just think that uh, where he has made, um, where he's made his findings, I mean, he, he, he set out on the record um, in the transcript and, and he made written findings where he set out his findings that were just simply put, he created a record, the record was insufficient to carry the presumption or rebut the presumption, um, that's, uh, that's the end of the matter here. He just mis mis misapplied the law and didn't find facts sufficient to be able to rebut the presumption. If there are no further questions, I'm content to rest my brief. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. Good morning, Your Honors. Rebecca Jacobstein uh, for Angel Cartagena. So the presumption of regularity applies when we don't know. So we don't know if things happen in the regular course. We don't know if the plea colloquy was constitutionally sound. The judge doesn't seem to know either. Well. He does. He knows that it wasn't. And so I think in the first instance, his feeling that the presumption... His, 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 he knows that he really never gave proper colloquies during this decade? That, not the entire decade. He says up until, 90, until 96, 98. Um, but he, that's, that's what... So to that extent, there's a... He made a finding that his, his inquiries were constitutionally inadequate up through 1998. That's what he said. His colloquies. You think that's his finding? That's that's his finding. You think one of his that was one of his findings was that he said up until 1996-98, um, I, I think as he put it in that time frame that he um, was not given constitutionally adequate colloquies because he said, but the reason was because he had he's he's getting that from opinions of this court or the S or the appeals court, correct? Yes. What he's what he's <coughs> noting, I, my reading of the transcript was that he said, you know. I was following the law as it was coming out. A lot of law, he said a lot of law was coming out during that time, which, which it was. And he recognized as a result of that law coming out that his previous colloquies were not sufficient. And he said, during that time, he said, I changed my colloquy to conform with all the law that was coming down. What about these docket entries, the, the stamped entry that said that the defendant uh, waived counsel? that he waived his jury trial and he admitted guilt knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily. That's not what he found the stamp to mean. He found that there was a stamp that said colloquy given. That stamp was not there. He said this stamp had to do with jury waivers. Um, so the defendant waived his right to a jury trial and admitted guilt knowingly, willingly, and voluntarily. He didn't, did not define that, that that meant there was a colloquy. So I would argue maybe what that meant was that I think the reality is, is that, you know, counsel wasn't there, but he was. He knows what the stamps mean. And if there's a missing stamp, one that says colloquy given, and that stamp's not there, that's an indication to him and that it's not there. And they discussed this, so he specifically... It's an indication that the colloquy wasn't given at all? 
Yes? Oh my. Oh. I'm not sure that he made a finding, but that support, that a specific finding that uh, there was no colloquy given. But I think he could have. And I think he found that, you know, the record did not, that that was, at, that was conspicuously absent. And that was something that they discussed, was that there might not um, have been a colloquy at all because. Oh. There's a jury trial. There's a jury waiver colloquy and no colloquy on the plea. Yes, Your Honor. And there was a jury waiver um, form filled out and not a a full constitutional right form. It, it, Do they have those forms in the BMC in those days? They he thought they did, and defense counsel but, thought but, they but did. But that's not my question. Do I I don't know. He he his memory of it. The judge's memory was that. Um, I don't remember if the judge had a memory. I remember defense counsel stating she had a memory that these forms were used back then. Um, but I don't know what, that the judge made a specific finding on that. I don't remember mm. that that's actually in the, in the record. Um, but I think that it's appropriate for this court to, uh, the brought up remand, you know, if the court feels that the findings are insufficient, I think remand would be appropriate. Um, so that he could make the sufficient findings. Because the question is, on this motion for a new trial, is it possible that justice was not done? And that's where we're at, is that justice may not have been done because there was not an adequate plea, plea colloquy. <coughs> if, if this court finds that the record may not support that, then we need to go back. But I think that the record does support that, because I think that the presumption need not necessarily apply if the judge can reconstruct the record, which he did. But I also think that you know there were the secondary factors in the, or missing in the record. Um, you know, the Commonwealth states that there's this, they fill out the, they check off the form that a colloquy was given, and it, it also says a waiver form has been filled out. You know, the defense waiver form for the constitutional rights, and that was <coughs> not filled out, there was just the jury trial form. So just because it says it happened doesn't mean it did happen, and the person who was really in the best position to determine what happened, determined what happened. He said, my plea colloquies weren't they weren't sufficient then. I followed the law. You know, I, I thought, watched the case law come down. I realized they weren't. I changed it to conform with the law. But previously, they were not. And I'm not going to presume that they were. Because he doesn't have to presume that they were. He just has to presume. Um, Doesn't he say that it was cases in which he was the judge? The jury trial waiver ones, yes. He says that I was thought in. It, thought it was actually, let's see, subsequent. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we've got this presumption. So who has the burden and what is the burden to overcome the presumption? So the defendant has to supply sufficient, credible, and reliable evidence to rebut the validity of the presumption. But, and he did that because he filed this affidavit. And the affidavit said, and of course, you know, the court is always able to say it's self serving and and, but it was supported by the record that he didn't get a colloquy. And didn't that, didn't no, get a colloquy at all. That's what he I'd said. I'd forgotten that. Okay. And then he said also that no one explained his, you know, all of these rights to him. Um, and that was supported by the fact that there was no overarching waiver form, just the jury trial waiver form. And so that was independently sufficient. But it was, you know, the record was then constructed by the judge absent all that by his recollection of his colloquies, by his customary practice. So the judge didn't, I'm, I'm confused here, the judge, the, the judge didn't find that he didn't give a colloquy. That would be a little ridiculous for the judge not to give a colloquy in a guilty plea. I mean, who does that in the Probably. 1990s, please? I wasn't there. He didn't, he didn't make that finding, but at the same time, he also credited the fact that, I mean, it, the fact that there was no notation on the docket was somehow meaningful to him because they discussed it and he put it in his written findings. I mean, I can't say exactly what weight he gave it. And um, how, did he, how did he make the finding? But there is a finding in there that the plea was knowing voluntarily and intelligently made? There is a, 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 a uh, stamp, yes, that there was a... Well, there would be a colloquy stamp, too. We're just talking about stamps, right? Really? Right. Well, that's, okay. you know, I know it seems a little ridiculous, but at the same time, I can... It was a finding, but no colloquy. I can envision one where you said, well, you're waiving this right to the jury trial, and you have, you know, a right to have the, your jury of your peers, and they have to be unanimous, and you're giving those rights, and you say, and you're charged with the following offense, and do you give up your rights knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily? Oh, come says, on. says, yes. 
Oh boy. Without identifying at all what those rights are in it's, the 90s? Well, it seems that po I got the impression that post the 60s. abolition uh, in, of the de novo trial that they were still giving the pre de novo trial colloquies. And I think that that is what he was, that was the impression I got from his ruling <coughs> that he had the, the pre, when, it, when you were just waiving your right to, um, and you could have had that de novo trial, he gave one set of colloquies, and he didn't necessarily update it when you were, in fact, doing the whole thing. That was the impression I got from the record. So, yes, that he did not go through all of those, and that's what he found. Um, apparently. It, it, was he saying that he thought all of his um, colloquies were uh, defective during that period of time? I think that's what he's saying. That means everyone who's had a trial before him could come back before us and challenge to, I didn't get a proper colloquy because the judge said so? I think that's right, Your Honor. That's what he found. Um, but again, I don't, which is why I, f I did find it interesting that he felt that there, that there was no docket notation that a colloquy was given. Did he give different colloquies that led to different stamps? I don't know. So I don't know if everybody would be entitled to it because his findings are not, are not particularly specific um, as to where the defects were and as to how, how this failure to have the proper colloquy stamps. And also, I mean, they note it, but it's not relevant here. The, the alien warning stamp um, was also missing. And so they were just, he, how those things all played into his decision, it's unclear to me. But, you know, it's a motion for new trial. Justice may not have been done, and it wasn't an abuse of discretion for him to look at all of these circumstances and say, you know what, this guy gets, an, you know, gets his plea back based on my reconstructing of the record and based on you know, the irregularities in the docket. So if there are no further questions, I will rest. Thank on you, counsel. All right, yes. thank you very much. We'll take a brief recess. All right. Yeah, careful.